ورشاد المرسي اخواني واخواتي والاخرين تحتاج الى لقاءات عديده ومحاضرات لكن نحن اليوم سناخذ اهم القضايا والاساليب في الارشاد النفسي الفعال And so the Sheikh says that although this is a very large topic that needs many lectures, inshallah, in today's talk, we'll try to cover the main points uh, that uh, deal with this, uh, that deal with personal guidance, inshallah. <laughs> أثناء الممارسة اليومية في جوانب الحياة المختلفة في العمر وفي جوانب الدعوة الخاصة. So the Sheikh says that the areas that we'll be covering today uh, are those that relate to uh, you know in everyday life and more specifically that relate to uh, the دعوة or calling towards Allah عز وجل. هو الاستقامة على الطريق الصحيح أو على الطريق الحق وهو أيضا الاستقامة على الطريق الطويل وهو ضد الطريق الخطأ أو الطريق الباطل أو الضلال. And so the Sheikh says that the meaning of guidance in the Arabic language is being steadfast upon the truth and it is Uh, upon the truth as well as guidance, and it is the opposite of misguidance. And so the Sheikh says that what we just mentioned right now, that is the linguistic definition of guidance. And when it comes to uh, what we're talking about, it is the process of um, basically, uh, it's a process that Uh, that's goal is to realize uh, the, um, the, the abilities that an individual has along with understanding oneself so that they may deal with the problems that come in, every, in, in their everyday life and more specifically uh, in da'wah. <laughs> And so what this does is um, this allows for that there to be uh, compatibility between Uh, all of the aspects of an individual's personality and it obviously also relates to the person's everyday life with regards to his personal life as well so that the person may realize his, uh, his, his worth along with also achieving the highest degrees of mental health. <laughs> الإرشاد النفسي هو يركز على جانب من جوانب الشخصية. الإرشاد النفسي يركز على جانب من جوانب الشخصية التي تتمثل في الجانب الإيماني، الجانب الأخلاقي، الجانب النفسي، والجانب أيضا الاجتماعي، والجانب العقلي، والجانب الجسماني. هذه جوانب الشخصية. جانب إيماني، جانب أخلاقي، جانب نفسي، جانب اجتماعي، جانب عقلي، وجانب 
هو يركز على هذه الجوانب لكن من منظور نفسي ولذلك سنركز نحن على الجانب النفسي دون الجوانب الاخرى And so the Sheikh says that this covers, uh, what we're talking about, psychological counseling actually covers many different aspects, including iman, belief, as well as the psychological aspect, uh, as well as like our, our body, bodily aspect, as well as the character, as well as our uh, mental state. But what it focuses most on is the psychological aspect and inshallah that's what we're going to focus on today. And so what this does is it's a process that includes a range of services that are offered to individuals to help them understand themselves and to recognize the problems. And so once we understand this distance that exists between us and ourselves, uh, meaning psychological, psych psychologically, then we achieve the ability to overcome these problems and we are then able to understand ourselves further. <laughs> So now the Sheikh is asking a question, why do we need guidance? And so the Sheikh says that with regards to guidance, there's many types. There's the one that deals with Iman, there's the one that deals with the community, there is the one that deals with innovation. So why is it that we need uh, the psychological guidance? It's a question that, you know, he's opening the floor for uh, your answers, inshallah. <laughs> So, without looking or without cheating, <laughs> if, if any time there's a question that's coming up and it's up on the board, just try not to look at it. And so if the sisters have any uh, answers... Okay, so the Sheikh says that what was on the board right now or what was on the slides were examples of this. What he wants is the reason for its importance. Why is it important? Why is psychological guidance important? <coughs> so the sisters, do you have any answer for this? Yeah. Uh, go ahead, please. Psychological guidance? Like yeah. specifically psychological? Yeah, psychological guidance for sure. Like things are going on our time, everything is going away from religion, you know, materialistic lifestyle, and so on. People are getting lost, people are falling out of direction. Like, there's no idea of religion, there's no idea of religion, there's no idea of religion. And so the Sheikh agrees with what you said, and uh, in addition, he says that another example that he's given is 
uh, this, this probably falls under uh, this as well, where the Sheikh says, the pressures of life that we face in our times now. And then the Sheikh says also in our community, so that we're compatible, we remain compatible, and we become, uh, we also, uh, there's also, uh, yeah, basically compatibility with us and the community around us, along with, you know, our family and all that. يقول غالبا في المجتمع الإسلامي لو توجد مشاكل نفسية غالبا ما نقول هي في الحقيقة بسبب خلل إيماني وما يعني يعني ما نتوجه للمشاكل النفسية. جميل ما ذكر أخونا أننا نظن نحن أنه إذا حصل هناك خلل في شخصية الإنسان أو ضعف في شخصية الإنسان أو خوف في شخصية الإنسان أو قلق عند الإنسان ننسب ذلك إلى ضعف الإيمان وهذا ليس صحيح وإنما هو إلى ضعف جوانب في الشخصية لأن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم مبارك عليه يقول ما يصيب المؤمن من هم ولا غم ولا نصب ولا وصل إلا كفر الله به من خطاياه إذا هذا المفهوم الذي يتبادر إلينا أن المشكلات النفسية أو ضغوطات الحياة أو القلق أو الخوف أو الحزن بسبب ضعف الإيمان ليس صحيحا وإنما الإنسان المؤمن المسلم أيضا هو يصاب بمثل ذلك لكن الله عز وجل يريد أن يكفر به الخطايا ويرفع به الدرجات and so the Sheikh says that what the brother said is true, and uh, we do find a lot of people saying this anytime they see any deficiencies in a person's uh, character or, or you know, psychological def deficiencies, or if that person is in a state of depression or is sad or is always fearful, then we usually blame it on uh, that person lacking Iman or something of that sort Whereas in reality, that person actually is suffering from, uh, you know, a, a deficiency in his character or personality. And the Prophet ﷺ actually mentioned um, in a narration where the, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said that, you know, there, are, uh, there, isn't a, there isn't anything that concerns a person or uh, basically is a source of sadness for a person except that Allah Azza wa Jal, He purifies that person through that. And so these things that a person in, or an individual faces, a lot of times these are also there uh, as a test from Allah Azza wa Jal to raise our ranks. <laughs> And so Iman does strengthen these aspects that we're that you know we were talking about the psychological aspect and the different aspects. If you know basically, uh, so yeah, that's what Iman does, and it can help us in overcoming these issues. But that's just one part of it. <laughs> يقول ممكن يعني نشرح ما هو النفس لأنه بعضهم يقولون النفس الجسد مع روح بعضهم يقولون الروح فقط النفس وردت في القرآن الكريم كثيرا النفس وردت في كتاب الله عز وجل كثيرا أكثر من ثلاث مئة مرة أكثر من ثلاث مئة مرة ولها معاني متعددة ولها معاني متعددة لكن العلماء يقولون هناك ثلاث إطلاقات أساسية ثلاث إطلاقات أساسية مرتبطة بهذا المعنى Uh, so the Sheikh says that the word nafs is mentioned 
multiple times, many times in the Quran, over 300 times, and it has many meanings uh, in the different uh, forms that it is mentioned in the Quran. And the scholars say that there are three main definitions related to this. And so the first meaning that uh, it covers is that of one spirit or one soul and that is mentioned in the verse where Allah Azza wa says that Allah is the one who uh, causes the soul to die. Uh, basically when a person dies Allah is the one that takes the soul away. So in this regard it's talking about the soul. Another meaning that it has is that of a person's heart or intellect, as some of those who explain the Qur'an's uh, verses mentioned. And so in the verse, Allah Azza wa Jal mentions that the people will not truly believe until they come to the Prophet وسلم, to resolve their issues and they are fully satisfied with that which the Prophet وسلم, tells them in terms of the judgment in that, uh, in that regard. And so over here, when it's talking about the nafs, that they don't find within their nafs any, uh, any issues related to the judgment of the Prophet them over here it means the heart or the intellect of a person, the thinking uh, that a person has. <laughs> And uh, the third meaning is the human being as a whole, the holistic human being, and this includes the intellect, the body, as well as the soul. And an example for this is when Allah Azza wa Jal mentions in the verse uh, telling us to save ourselves, to protect ourselves and our uh, families from the fire. So this includes all aspects of the nafs. So it's talking about the human being as a whole, the intellect, the body, as well as the soul. <laughs> And so when it's uh, when it's talking to uh, the ruh or the, uh, the soul, it talks about iman, belief, as well as character and these uh, issues related to that. And when it comes to addressing uh, the intellect, then that is through uh, discussions and thinking and pondering. And when it's addressing the, bod uh, the bodily aspect of it, it's, it talks about feeding it, uh, clothing it, and, um, you know, uh, basically treating it from any ailments. And so, guidance actually uh, addresses all three aspects, the intellect, the body, as well as the soul, all three aspects of the human being, of, of, of the human being. And so, 
أو نقتصر على أدوات الإرشاد النفسي بما يسمح به الوقت. الآن تقريبا مضى ساعة ونحن لا نزال في المقدمة. يهمنا نحن هنا أن نقدم بعض الأدوات المفاهيم الأدبيات التي يستعين بها الداعية والمربي والأب والزوج في حياته في خطاب الجانب النفسي. And so because the time here uh, is very limited, um, and we, the Sheikh mentioned in, in the introduction that the topic is actually a very large topic, uh, we will only focus on the basically the psychological guidance over here, and this is what is essential for the caller to Islam as well as to the spouse when dealing with their spouse uh, with their spouses as well as the father when dealing uh, with their children and the mother also dealing with their children so we're going to cover this aspect and the sheikh says we've taken all this time right now and we're still in the introduction meaning that you know we there still is a lot to cover so it's, he's just trying to let us know that you know we have a limited amount of time to cover a lot <laughs> And so the Sheikh is grateful for the brother for his question because this was a means of, you know, uh, discussing this topic and inshallah entering into the next. And so the question that the brother asked was about, uh, you know, what Allah Azza wa mentions in the Quran with regards to the nafs that is, um, uh, with regards to a specific uh, verse. And so the Shaykh says that the soul or the nafs, they're all one, but it has different states. Um, so there, there, there are three states mentioned in the Quran. The first is that of Ammara Basu, a soul or, or the nafs that entices or encourages one to do bad. And then the next step or the, the next state, which is better than that state, is the Lawama state, which is basically the, blame, the blaming state where one blames oneself for the, for the bad that one may be doing. And the third state is that of, of being mutma'inna, which is being satisfied and pleased. And this is the highest state. And so the Shaykh says that what we are covering right now with regards to uh, psychological guidance, what it attempts to do is it attempts to connect the individual to Iman and all these different things so that uh, basically we could build up from the bottom of the, the state that we mentioned is at the bottom up until we get to uh, the Lawama, up until we get 
to the state where we are uh, satisfied. And so uh, there are also areas in between these three states, but basically through this, we are attempting to, insha'Allah, gradually increase. <laughs> And so the Sheikh says that we're going to cover some of the goals that psychological guidance has. From these goals is the people uh, gaining uh, or trusting themselves. Basically, getting uh, the, the people are able to trust themselves. The other thing it does as well is it grants us a sense of belonging to, to the ummah, to the nation, as well as strengthening the bonds with our community. And... Uh, and so anything that relates to their life, uh, that is what it attempts to help in. And it also attempts to assist in making a positive change in one's behavior and character. And it also helps in uh, granting us the ability to solve problems or uh, issues that come up. And it also helps to improve relation or our relationships with others. And it also helps us uh, in self-realization and with uh, being basically being more compatible with the society as well. And so the Sheikh says that there are different dimensions with regards to uh, the psychological guidance that we're talking about. There's the first part that deals with the personal dimension, and the second part deals with the environmental aspects that also shape uh, the, psych the psychological development of a person. And so the question is, why do we need a psychological guidance? And this question is both for the brothers and the sisters. Sisters, not examples, rather reasons. Why do we need uh, personal guidance? Sorry, uh, psychological guidance. Well, in relationship to young people, um, there needs to be some kind of path or uh, ultimate goal, which is what the Sheikh's talking about, how to achieve higher states of psychological balance. So when somebody is in a position to have the experience to guide others, this is very, very, um, important um, in order for people to know a direction and how to to develop themselves internally. Uh, okay, and uh, because I think a lot of people feel separated from the whole, 
from the story. Can you repeat that they feel separated from? From the whole, like the, you know, the, the community? community feel okay. Separated from the unity, feel separated from the whole. Okay. Because many people are uh -huh. Anything else from the brothers? What? Uh? Okay. Uh, can you just repeat what you said in the first part? I didn't hear you properly, or just raise your voice a bit. Uh -huh. So the brother he's mentioning uh, that in the Quran, Allah Azza wa Jal mentions through the tongue of Yaqub alayhi salam. Um, uh, basically that we should not uh, lose hope in the mercy of Allah and so the brother is saying that um, we basically need this form of guidance to help us achieve uh, the hope in Allah's mercy and whereas the non-Muslims they don't have or they don't believe in the mercy of Allah which can cause them to commit suicide when faced with problems. Did I get that right? لا يعني يؤمنون برحمة الله لذلك يعني أحيانا يصير إلى يعني ينتحرون. And is there any other? Sorry, there's a uh, there's just one brother right now. To overcome personal psychological barriers and therefore to also help others within the community in a large overcome psychological barriers. يقول يعني الأفراد في المجتمع حتى يعني المشاكل اللي توجد عندهم. Did the sisters hear that answer? No. Uh, the brother was saying that uh, it helps to overcome personal problems that an individual may have and individuals in the community as a whole may have. Uh, without the appropriate uh, uh, guidance or personal guidance, uh, it may corrupt the fitrah and that doesn't allow a person to worship Allah in the appropriate way. Maybe it's easier. <laughs> Did the sisters get the answer? That uh, did the sisters hear that answer? The previous one. The brother was basically. The brother was saying that. Uh, can you repeat? Yeah. So basically, if we don't have uh, this guidance, psychological guidance then it can corrupt our fitrah, the ability or the innate ability towards goodness, which will take us away from Allah. All right, so the shaykh will move on just because of uh, the time constraints. <laughs> So, 
وإرشاد النفس يصب في هذا الاتجاه ويساعدون على ذلك. And so the, the Sheikh is saying that all the answers that you gave there are correct and they all do uh, lead to this uh, and so now inshallah the Sheikh is going to say. And so the Sheikh says that we mentioned that there are multiple aspects to this guidance. The first is that which deals with the personal dimension, and that is what uh, it's basically a group of or a set of motivations that uh, motivates a person. Uh, you know, to, for their need, in terms of their needs, their emotions, as well as those things that drive the individual to carry out um, social activity, as well as, um, you know, their character and other things. And so the Sheikh says the second aspect is, uh, or the second dimension is that which relates to the environment around a person. And this could be a person's family, this could be a person's community. This could be a person's school or work, uh, the workplace. All of these uh, conditions that one is in also uh, deal with this. And so the first aspect deals with the person's self, and the second aspect deals with the community that one lives in. And the next thing, or the, the other dimension that we also need assistance in is the cognitive and mental dimension. And it includes, um, you know, trends and, sorry, it includes values and it includes customs and it includes uh, uh, all these different ideals, and uh, as it mentions here in the slide, all these are directed towards a community, and uh, and so that there is a unified objective. And the last aspect is the human dimension, and it is basically uh, exemplified through the different means of uh, communication between an individual and the community and between the individual and uh, amongst the different aspects so basically within his local community or the international community uh, the young with the old the old with the young the men and the uh, and the women all these so that it leads to a positive uh, end result And 
And so the shaykh says that uh, there are different uh, things that basically lead to a successful uh, counseling. And the shaykh says that we are specifically talking about the specialty that we mentioned in, uh, from the get-go. Although it covers many different aspects, we are talking about uh, the psychological guidance over here. <laughs> And so uh, the first essential thing is that the there has to be uh, respect between the counselor and the person who's receiving this counseling and this person basically has to respect this uh, counselor um, and also uh, you know has to basically be patient and wait until this counselor has uh, completed with his task instead of jumping to conclusions and having preconceived notions with regards to this counselor. <laughs> And so basically, uh, the person who is receiving this counseling, he must feel or she must feel that the counselor understands the person's problems and his feelings uh, towards whatever issue that he is or she is facing. Uh, so basically, there has to be that aspect as well where the counselor has uh, basically lets the individual feel that he understands or she understands the individual properly. <laughs> The other important thing is that if this um, person seeking uh, this guidance or counseling feels that the counselor is sincere has a sincere desire to help, then this too will be a very positive thing, uh, inshallah. And so the Sheikh says that an example of this is that the counselor, he lets the person feel that he is giving that individual the full attention, that he is listening carefully to what he is saying, and that he is also looking at that individual, the full focus is on that individual as he's talking and he's not distracted with other things or he's not, you know, doing other things at the same time. <laughs> And the Sheikh says, conversely, if the person is not listening attentively to the individual, is not looking at the individual, and is busy with other things, distracted by his phone or something else, then the Sheikh says that this session or this counseling will not be successful. And so the Sheikh says that before 
he moves along with other examples of, uh, you know, important things or things that are necessary with regards to uh, this form of guidance. The Sheikh wants to hear from you guys. What do you think are other uh, important aspects or other important factors in uh, psychological guidance? Needs a psychological guidance of some sort of constitution. Some sort of constitution. You cannot, you can apply as a professor in the medical college all the constitution issues to be applied. So sorry, can you repeat that? So it can be? All the constitution issues can be applied. Like the start of rapport. The rapport is very important as so the this one should be uh, respecting you and feeling that you are confident and confident in your guidance. Sorry, I, I didn't get that. Can you repeat the point? Very uh, important. Uh. And you should feel that you are confident about yourself. You are not giving psychological support one and you are not confident about yourself. You should feel that you are confident and you should feel that you are confident in your strengths and in guiding you. Also, taking care about the time. Time management is very important in the psychological session. Also, taking the cues, looking for the cues of the body language of mind when uh, uh, I'm consulting with. It's very important. يقول المسترشد لازم يشعر بأن المرشد يثق في نفسه فيما يقول ثانية جميل 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 وكذلك يعني الشيء الثاني المهم يقول يهتم بالوقت مثلا alright anyone else Well, I think one of the most important things that the Sheikh mentioned earlier is that before... Closer. I'm leaving. <laughs> before you... Uh, if, if there isn't trust, then uh, everything won't work. And the trust is based on that the other person feels understood. I mean, it's not a matter of trust between the Mursheed and the Mursheed. And this will be when... يشعر الإنسان بأن هناك يعني تفاهم بين الاثنين. أكبر المرشد للمسترشد بالنصيحة في حل مشاكله ورب 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 العالمين التخفيف آلامي بالكلام الطيب وربه إلى التوحيد وأصل الإيمان يثبت يقينا المشكلة ويرتعب التجارب. Okay, so the, go ahead, say it in English. The sincerity of the guide or the counselor towards the patient and the sincerity in involving this process and making him in good relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and finding him with more of this and the every part. As the microphone connected to the sisters as well, they should be able to hear, right? And the transference from the light of special convenience that will to support psychologically the patient and the force him to withstand and defeat bravely his work. From the sisters, uh, the Sheikh's asking, is there any answers from the sisters' side? Any sisters? Or I guess uh, from the brothers? I'm just going to second Brother Salah was saying sincerity is the key thing, but also uh, a counselor should be a good listener in order to understand what the real issues and the problems are. So this is also to show that the person that he is doing with sincerity and that he is really uh, eager to help. So that trust and bond between the counselor and the counselor is very important mm -hmm. uh, to guide them to a psychological. أها وذكر نفس النقطة اللي ذكرنا في البداية إنه المسترشد يشعر بال بالإخلاص من المرشد وكذلك أي نعم
honestly, and uh, as well as experience. أقول الخبرة مهمة وكذلك أن نفهم يعني أعراف هذا الشخص قد تكون يعني أعراف مختلفة. طيب إذا إخوة إخواني أخواتي ما ذكرتموه هو مكمل لهذه العوامل والعوامل يصعب نحن نتحدث عن كل العوامل لكن نحن ضربنا أمثلة. وهذه الأمثلة ركزنا فيها على الجانب النفسي على الجانب المشاعر العواطف لم نتطرق إلى الجوانب العملية الأخرى وإن كانت هي مهمة ومكملة لبعضها البعض فما ذكرتموه من الإخلاص والصدق والحرص والاهتمام والخبرة والتجربة هذه كلها تحقيق عوامل تساعد المرشد على تحقيق رسالته واستفادة أيضا المسترشد and so the sheikh says that there are too many factors to cover uh, and therefore we only limited ourselves to the factors that relate to uh, uh, basically this aspect and you know uh, we took some examples so we're only dealing with you know certain uh, aspects such as the emotional and the sort and so all the examples that we mentioned the sheikh says these are all really good in completing what he was talking about with regards to sincerity, the person having experience, the person uh, feeling that the counselor is actually motivated to help the individual. And so all these things are important for the counselor as well as helping the person seeking this counseling as well. <laughs> بمعنى أن الإرشاد يكون عن هذه العوامل إذا توافرت هذه العوامل في بيئة الإرشاد فسوف ينجح عملية هذا الإرشاد وتتحقق هيك الثمرة أو النتيجة التي يسعى إليها المرشد مع المسترشد. And so the sheikh says that if the guidance is based on these factors that we just mentioned, then inshallah it will lead to a successful session. And uh, this is, you know, basically this topic in, in summary. ونحن تحدثنا عن العوامل السابقة وأكدنا عليها لأن هناك أنواع من المسترشدين هذه مجموعة من أنواع يعني عندنا الإيجابي عندنا السلبي عندنا النشط المهتم عندنا الخامل عندنا الشكاك عندنا المرتاب هذه مجموعة من أنواع المسترشدين فلذلك نحتاج نحن نستخدم العوامل المناسبة مع هؤلاء And so the sheikh says that we mentioned all those factors because when we're talking about these people seeking this counseling, there are many different categories of these individuals. There may be some that are positive. There are others who are always pessimistic. There are others that are active. There are others who are very uh, uh, low energy types or introverted. So dealing with all these different uh, characteristics or traits that are found in these individuals, it is important that we have those factors covered as well. And so, in light of all that we've taken, the Sheikh says we can see how this guidance is built upon these different things, such as understanding the different types of individuals that are seeking this guidance, along with the different factors that are involved in, uh, in guidance. على 
امثلة على ارشاد النفس من النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يعني من سيره النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ما رسى مع اصحابه امثلة الصحابه ما رسوها مع يعني اتباعهم او مع في في مجتمعاتهم او في بيئاتهم او الاباء ما رسوها مع اولادهم وما شابه ذلك And so what the Shaykh wants now is, after covering these different uh, aspects and factors, now the Shaykh wants examples from the life of the Prophet Sallallahu how he dealt with uh, his companions, or how the companions dealt with those who came after them, or how the husbands, uh, you know, dealt with issues concerning their wives and vi vice versa, and the fathers with their, or the parents with their children, and so basically he wants to hear examples uh, that we can mention right now. Sorry? المثال يكون مرتبط بالجانب النفسي بالجانب النفسي الجانب الشخصي تفضل تعلمه ان ياكل الكثير ارتفع به من مستوى التسوي الى مستوى الاعتماد على نفسه لو رحت بيها في التسويه بدل ما وان داي امام كيف تهم اصلي ينكر شيء لو رحت بيها في التسويه بدل ما اصلي في الوقت اللي هات في يوم في سيت اي هات سم باوت اي سم كوكينج And so, yeah, the Sheikh says that the, basically the, what the brother mentioned, the example with regards to the companion who came asking for money, the Prophet ﷺ instead guided him to earn for himself and to be a positive member in the community. Uh, and so this is a great example of, you know, a person coming forth and instead of asking and begging, the person, uh, the Prophet ﷺ teaches him to instead, uh, you know, earn with his own hands. <laughs> Uh, 
ان يعني بعض بعض زوجات النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قالت انت يعني يهوديه فيعني النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم لما يعني هو هو ذكر لها انه مثلا تستطيع ان تقولين انه ابوك نبي وعمك نبي هذا نموذج كمان مهم هذا النموذج اللي يعني يقول فيه نموذج فيه ارشاد ايجابي نحو هذه المشكله التي حدثت في بيت النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم بين ازواجه فحزنت احداهن فارشدها النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم الى انها تفتخر ب انها ابنه ذلك الرجل الذي كان وكان يعني هذه واحده ايضا من يعني التطبيقات العمليه في عمليه التوجيه يعني الارشاد النفسي بالذات وهذا له بعد نفسي كما تلاحظون له بعد نفسي في بيت النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم حتى شعرت ايضا هذه الصفيه للفرح والغبطه والسرور بعد ان كانت يعني حزينه مما سمعت من الاخرى And so the Sheikh says this is a great example, uh, you know, the example that happened amongst the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where uh, one of the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who was formerly a Jew, uh, basically when she was made to feel, uh, you know, really bad about, you know, having been of her past, instead the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave her uh, um, uh, you know, told her to rather be proud of the fact that even her forefathers were uh, prophets as well. So basically, this wife of the Prophet ﷺ, who came to the Prophet ﷺ really sad and depressed, ended up being really happy and uh, cheerful after this. And so, so, sorry, so, so we see the personal dimension that the Sheikh was talking about. Another example. I remember the occasion where a young man came to the Prophet seeking permission for adultery. And then the companions like the Prophet made him take a closer and then put his uh, hand on the chest of the young man and said, Would you accept that for your mother, for your sister, for your aunt? And the uh, young man, young companion, replies saying, No, and then he like, uh, reflects his ideas and he thinks and reviewing the different spirits uh, occasion. And finally, uh, he needs to call Allah, having no intention to make that about يعني ايضا هذا يا اخوه نموذج ايضا اخر في الارشاد في الارشاد وتلاحظون هي قصه الرجل الذي جاء يطلب من النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم الاذن بالزنا فالرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم ارشده وخاطبه وتعامل معه معه حسب البيئه التي كان يعيش فيها ولذلك طلع عليه مجموعه من الاسئله ونقاش وحوار بهدوء مع انه جاء يطلب من النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم امرا محرما من كبائر الذنوب فالرسول الله صلى الله وسلم عليه استوعبه وتعامل معه برفق وتعامل معه بليل وحاوره وناقشه وارشده وراعى الجوانب النفسيه والبيئيه عنده فكانت الثمره او النتيجه انه اصبح رجلا يحب النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وبارك عليه ويبغض ويكره هذه الفاحشه التي جاء يريد الاذن فيها، وهذا مظهر الحقيقه من مظاهر الارشاد الايجابي، الارشاد الفعال، الارشاد النفسي الذي مارسه الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم وبارك عليه مع هذا الصحابي، مع هذا الصحابي الذي جاء يساله في هذا الامر. And so in this example that the brother mentioned, the sheikh says, we see the, the basically the, the positivity that was there in the Prophet Sallallahu uh, manner when dealing with this issue, he understood the society that that person came from and based on that, he was able to have a discussion with this individual. Even though this person was coming to the Prophet Sallallahu seeking permission to do something haram, one of the major sins in Islam, the Prophet Sallallahu remained calm and discussed with him 
in a way that that person or individual would be able to understand and relate to. And there's, this resulted in this individual leaving this gathering, hating this act, and loving the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, I have an example as well. Go ahead, sister. Uh, when the Bedouin brought the watermelon to the Prophet and he ate it all, he didn't share it with the Sahaba. And at the end, they asked why he didn't share it with us, and we said because the watermelon was not really sweet, and I didn't want to embarrass the Bedouin by you are saying, oh, this watermelon is not sweet. So he ate it all by himself. أقول <تصفيق> لا حتى ما يشعر الأعرابي يعني الصحابة لم يأكلون يظهر على وجوههم So the Sheikh says he hasn't uh, heard of this story Is there another example from the sister side? Sisters? of housework and the Prophet she wanted a maid and the Prophet told them that should I give you something better? So instead of um, saying yeah it's really hard for you he gave her something better than a maid, he gave her the husband. Fatima رضي الله عنها لما طلبت خادمة النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم بدل ما يعني يعطي ما يعطي أيضا يعني نقطة كما تقول ما ذكرته في شهد النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم لفاطمة رضي الله عنها عندما جاءت إلى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم تسأله خادمة فأرشدها صلى الله عليه وسلم إلى تطبيق عملي وإلى ذكر نبوي يوفر لها الحقيقة ويعطيها قوة والنشاط والحيوية خير لها من خادمة أو من خادم وذكر أنه إذا آوى يعني إذا آوى إلى فراشهما فليكبر يعني فليسبح الله ثلاثة وثلاثين وليحمد الله ثلاثة وثلاثين وليكبر الله ثلاثة وثلاثين ثم يختمون بقول لا إله إلا الله في المياه هذا خير من خادم وهذا جانب معنوي يعني أن في هذا الذكر وفي محافظة عليه وفي تطبيقه ما يقوم الإنسان ويساعده حتى لا يحتاج إلى مساعدة آخرين يعني هذا فيه التوجيه يعني وفيه إرشاد إلى هذا الجانب إذا جميل نحن الحقيقة استمعنا إلى مجموعة من التطبيقات والممارسات العملية جزء منها ومرتبطة أيضا بالنبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وبارك عليه سمعنا عن إرشاد المهني للرجل الذي أجاء يتسول فأرشده إلى طريقة عملية للعمل والتكسب وسمعنا أيضا إرشاد نفسي إيجابي فعال في العلاقة بين زوج النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وكيف أرشد النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أولئك سمعنا أيضا إرشاد الشاب الذي جاء يطلب الإذن بالزنا كيف تعامل النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وبارك عليه في التعامل مع هذا الشاب وأقنعه والأمثلة يا إخوة والنماذج والتطبيقات في السيرة النبوية كثيرة إذا كان الوقت قرر ونحن ممكن نبدأ سأذكر لكم نموذج على إرشاد الطفل ونذكر نموذج في إرشاد حل المشكلات ونذكر أيضا كمان نموذج أيضا آخر في التعامل مع الزوجات ونذكر أيضا نموذج في التعامل مع الأعراب أو مع الجهاد في بعض المسائل وفي واقع اليوم تكثر هذه الأشياء وأذكر لكم أيضا نموذج في التعامل مع الأبناء التعامل مع الأبناء في التربية لكن نترك ذلك بعد البريك بإذن الله تبارك وتعالى And so the Sheikh says that uh, basically uh, all the examples that we took, uh, they all, uh, you know, they show um, basically different aspects, especially that which relate to the Prophet ﷺ with regards to work. So that Sahabi, that companion who came to the Prophet 
seeking money, the Prophet ﷺ instead guided him towards earning himself. We also covered uh, examples that deal with marital problems. We also, with regards to you know what uh, the bro what the brother mentioned, uh, the wife of the Prophet ﷺ coming and complaining about what the other wives had said. We also covered uh, the uh, the example where the Sahabi or the companion came to the Prophet ﷺ, um, seeking permission to commit adultery. And the Shaykh says there are many examples from the lives of the, from the life of the Prophet ﷺ that we can mention. And inshallah, if there is time towards the end, we will mention some of these inshallah uh, examples of the Prophet ﷺ dealing with children, examples of the Prophet ﷺ dealing with the Bedouins, or examples of the Prophet ﷺ dealing with the ignorant. But inshallah, we'll keep all this towards the end. And now we're going to inshallah break. Inshallah, uh, please be back in 15 minutes. 15 minutes, so we're going to start at 11 o'clock.
استعداد اخرى للارشاد النفسي And so the Sheikh will also mention other uh, means of implementation for uh, this psychological guidance. And so the Sheikh wants us to note that in all the examples that we're covering, all of them related are related to the psychological guidance that which relates to a person's psychology, the person's self. And that is uh, uh, because of the importance of it with regards to accepting information and uh, working on it. And so the Sheikh is now going to give an example of um, some issues that may come up in or an example of an issue that came up in the marital life. And the example he gives is uh, when Fatima radiallahu had the daughter of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, had a disagreement with her husband, uh, Ali radiallahu anh. Ali radiallahu anh, he left the house and went to the masjid. So when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam came, entered into the house, uh, he asked Aisha radiallahu anh about uh, the whereabouts of Ali radiallahu anh. And she told him that he had left the house and then he found him in the masjid. Uh, and so when he found him in the masjid, he said, uh, get up, O oh, uh, Abu Turab, basically uh, meaning, uh, because you know there was dust on Ali radiallahu anh, but this was a way of him calling upon Ali radiallahu anh in a very loving manner. And then they went together uh, to, to his house, to Ali radiallahu anh's house, and they resolved the issue. So the, this too is an example of uh, the Prophet وسلم, counseling in uh, marital problems. And so the Sheikh is talking about another example. He says, a man who has two wives, and there are some guests who come visit the second wife, and so the first wife sends some food over to the house of the second wife for the guests, and then the second wife getting upset at the fact that the first wife had sent all this food, uh, takes this food along with the platters and you know all the dishes and throws them on the floor breaking them and all this happens or takes place in front of the guests what what, what do you think the reaction would be in our times like what would happen in this case what do you think would happen one of the brothers he said divorce 
uh, what would happen? Like, realistically, what do you think would happen in this case? How would we react to this? So, so the, the brother says that, uh, you know, in front of the guests, uh, the husband would probably scold his wife for what she had done. Sisters, uh, how do you think your husbands or people you know would react? Well, first of all, nowadays, um, men don't have their wives interacting or they have secret wives. So the, the idea that she would send food is in very rare cases. Okay, so basically this is in the scenario that both wives do know that they're married uh, to the individual. So in this scenario, what do you think would happen? I think that, I, 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 I think that he would just try to make something light of it, help to, you know, ask the maid to pick it up and just move on. This is a culture here. يعني التي any other reactions that you would expect? I think the reaction of the guests is also important. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. But I think the Sheikh wants to know how the husband would deal with the situation or how you think the person would react. Um, can we say something? Yes, go ahead, sister. I think he would either scream at her and make a big deal out of it, or he would laugh it off. It depends on the husband. But I want to add, like, um, actually, she should have been grateful that the other wife helped, you know, to feed all these guests, because it's a lot of work to entertain guests. <laughs> Yeah, I think, I think the matter relates more to jealousy and all between the wives that may exist. So even acts of kindness are perceived in a different manner when that happens. But the husband should know the character and the qualities and the psychological makeup of each of his wives. And if he knows the second woman has this predisposition, then he should discourage the first wife. And if he didn't do that, then it's his fault. And he probably will punish the second wife and tell the first wife to stay out of his business. All right. I think that the best option is a very big list about his personality, his character, his educational level, his background, his sexual identity, his sexual feeling. So, unfortunately, Unfortunately, we don't uh, expect that the Muslims now are uh, following the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam behavior and attitude. I said this previously, but we should do a great difference between what should be in and what's our real uh, life. I like to stress about this because I feel that most of the systems are being unhappy because they're expecting a lot of punishment which is not uh, the Islamic purpose. هو يقول أن ردة فعل الرجل راجعة إلى تعليمه شخصيته يعني إلى أمور كثيرة إلى عوامل كثيرة ولكن الأهم أننا ننظر إلى كيفية التعامل النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم مع زوجاته. <تصفيق> Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Yeah, uh, inshallah, if there's anything important, we'll mention that. Okay, so we can think of uh, so many uh, reactions other than or except the reaction of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu Because he, he, was, he was the teacher, he's the teacher. He just wanted to teach the, the companions as well as uh, Mother Aisha. Uh, may Allah uh, send mercy on him. But uh, our reactions will be, I'm sure our reactions will be so different from reaction <laughs> اثناء الارشاد والتوجيه والتعامل مع هذه المشكله ولذلك قال صلى الله عليه وسلم لاصحابه قد غارت امكم يعني هذا من الغيره التي فطرت عليها المراه فهي تفعل ذلك غيرها لان التركيبه النفسيه والعقليه للمراه لا تستطيع ربما ان تتحمل مثل هذا الموقف في مثل هذه الحاله بسبب دافع الغيره الموجود في النفس البشريه ولذلك النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم لم يفعل شيئا لم يفكر لا في الثالثه ولا في الرابعه ولم يفكر في امر اخر لا في عتاب ولا في عقاب ولا شيء اخر وانما قال غارت امكم بمعنى ان هذا الدافع الذي فعلته هو بسبب الغيره عند المراه في مثل هذا الموقف وانتهى الموقف ثم قام وجمع الطعام وطلب من الاولى ان ترسل صحفة أخرى مقابل الصفحة التي كسرت في هذا الموقف. مقصودي من هذا الكلام أن هناك مراعاة للجانب النفسي عند علاج هذه المشكلة في عملية الإرشاد في هذا الموضوع. And so the Sheikh says this example that he gave, it's not just, uh, firstly it was to get our minds going. But it wasn't just a random scenario that the Shaykh brought up. Rather, this was something that happened to the Prophet وسلم, when uh, one of the wives actually of the Prophet وسلم, did actually uh, end up breaking the plate of the other wife when this happened. And the Prophet وسلم, instead of reacting and punishing uh, his wife or saying something, you know, um, uh, or yelling at her, or scolding her, instead, all he said was, your mother, meaning, you know, she, uh, they're, all the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they're our, our mothers. He said, your mother got jealous, and due to that, basically, that it is that thing that caused her to break this plate. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he didn't think of what, uh, uh, what punishment he would, you know, give her, or what sh he would say to her, yell at her. Rather, he took the psychological aspect into account, in knowing that in such a scenario, there is jealousy that comes in when you know a, one of the wives is sending something uh, to the house of the second. Uh, and so he took that into account, and instead of yelling at that wife, all he did was he collected the food, and then he told this wife, or this wife of his to send a plate uh, to the other wife as a replacement for the plate that she had broken. <laughs> Can I add something to it? And then, uh, uh, I think that there is another uh, deeper meaning. Close, think, close. Okay. I think that there is another deeper meaning in close. the way Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam reacted I mean, to the, um, the action uh, done by uh, the wife, uh, the wife of the Isabel Hair. You know, when he committed and he said, in front of the companions, keep it close. he said, that your mother got jealous. So uh, I think that it was very smart because I mean, when the companions saw the action of the of the wife, they might have they might have you know uh, got very angry or upset with the action. But when Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, "Your mother got jealous," so he reminded the companions that what happened is by the mother. So. I mean, what would you do if something happened by your mother? You could sympathize with her. You wouldn't get angry. You wouldn't, you wouldn't get upset. 
So there is another deeper meaning in the way the Prophet Muhammad you know, commented, uh, commented on the, uh, the action done by his wife. الذي يقوم بالإرشاد كما ذكر حتى في هذا الموقف الصعب لم يغضب لم يغضب وإنما استوعب الموقف ويعني استوعب القضية ووجه وأرشد له الأمر جميل كلام جميل شكرا تعليق جميل ومناسب طيب مثال آخر يرفع في عملية الإرشاد هذا رجل دخل إلى المسجد نظيف في وقت الصلاة وهو يريد أن يصلي في المسجد بحذائه فكيف يكون التصرف معه من جماعة المسجد أو من حضور أو من إمام المسجد أو من المؤذن أو من أي شخص آخر في المسجد عندما وجد هذا الرجل دخل المسجد في حذائه للصلاة ماذا سيفعل تفعل معه؟ And so the Sheikh says another example that he wants to take is that of a man who enters a masjid and he enters a masjid to pray but he enters in with his shoes what would be the reaction of those around him, whether it's the imam, whether it's the mu'adhan, whether it's the fellow congregation, how would they react to this individual who enters at the time of prayer with his shoes on? Uh, from the brothers and sisters, please, uh, we'd like some answers. What would happen right now in our times? Like, you know, we have carpeting in the masjids, the shoes are spoiled and dirty. There would be some parameters who would keep on saying, keep screaming at him, bruh, bruh, bruh. That's what happened. Of course, Kono Nak, bruh, man. Where's the mic? Okay. Well, well, just so that it can be heard by everyone, just use the mic and shout. Yeah, going to be unexpected behavior actually, you know, so maybe we're going to lose tolerance or become very angry and start yelling in front of everybody, so you know, to make him, you know, very embarrassed in front of other people, so that's his time, so our first reaction towards this action. الناس ما يعرفون كيف يواجهون المشكلة ربما يفضح هذا الإنسان أمام الناس This happened in our masjid about 10 years ago when uh, the police were called for an issue and they came in with the shoes uh, so there was a huge issue and it went in the news and it was very bad that all the Muslims at that time so what, what was the reaction of the congregation? Uh, so basically all the congregants got really angry and started yelling at the police officers and they weren't really explaining that this is the place of prayer uh. يقول هذا حصل قبل عشر سنوات في مسجدي في كندا بأن يعني الشرطي دخل المسجد بحذائه فالناس عاتبوه يعني بدل ما يفهموا أن هذا المسجد نظيف وهذا فهذا يعني صار كبرت المشكلة إلين وصلت الأخبار هذا المود اللي يوم يخوى الموضج أيضا في التعامل مع مثل هذه المشكلة وكيف حيكون الإرشاد والتوجيه فيها ورعات الجانب النفسي سنفكر بطريقة أخرى في حل هذه المشكلة غير الطريقة التي ربما نتعامل بها الآن And so the Sheikh says that if we take the psychological aspect uh, if we keep that in mind the way we react to the situation is going to be very different because we're going to be taking that into account أن يكون مريض نفسيا it could be that this individual, he is uh, uh, mentally ill. He could be uh, insane. It could be that, that this person is ignorant. It could be that this person had read uh, in the prophetic guidance that salah is acceptable even if it is prayed, uh, or even if one prays in his or her shoes. And it could be that there were many issues concerning him, such as something going on in his house, which caused him to, you know, completely forget that he entered the masjid with his shoes on. And so the Sheikh says that there, uh, there was an individual who was telling the Sheikh that he entered into the masjid and he started smoking in the masjid 
but he was going through so much mentally that he thought that he was actually outside. And so it is very essential and important that this counselor, this guidance counselor, takes all these things into account. The person's psychological uh, state and all these things need to be taken into account when he is guiding this person. And so the Prophet وسلم, uh, during the time of the Prophet وسلم, this man who used to live in the desert, a desert dweller, a Bedouin, he enters into the masjid of the Prophet وسلم, and in the presence of the Prophet وسلم, and his companions, he urinates in the masjid. What is worse or what is greater uh, or more, you, you know, what's worse? Urinating in the masjid or entering the masjid with shoes on? Obviously urinating. And so when the companions, they wanted to react, the Prophet ﷺ, he said to them, let this person be, let him do what he's doing. And then after this individual, this Bedouin completed what he was doing, then the Prophet ﷺ ordered for some water to be brought and poured over this area to purify this area. And then he dealt with the issue. <laughs> And so due to the way that the Prophet ﷺ dealt with the situation, this Bedouin who had entered into the masjid and did what he did, he ended up loving the Prophet ﷺ, loving the rest of the believers, loving Islam, as well as knowing how, how to uh, carry himself in the future, knowing that you know he's not supposed to urinate in the masjid. <laughs> And so the Prophet وسلم, in the way that he guided this individual and the way he reacted to the situation, if he had from the get-go uh, started yelling at the companion or this uh, man who had entered the masjid and urinated, if he had told him, don't you realize that this is a masjid or what are you doing or started yelling at him in front of everyone else, it's possible that this individual may have left the masjid, never come back or even worse, left Islam altogether. But instead, the Prophet وسلم, he realized the person's psychological state and realized also that you know there, there might also be other harms with, relate, uh, with relation to the person holding in his urine. Uh, it might affect his body in a negative manner and all that. And the Prophet وسلم, took all that into account and then he dealt with the situation in a way that resulted in this individual not only learning that it was wrong what he did, but also loving the Prophet وسلم, and Islam even more. And that's why it's very important that when we're dealing with these kind of scenarios where we're correcting people, that we take all these things into account, their psychological state uh, and all this, so that the person in the end 
ends up loving us and the deen and that which we're calling towards in terms of the guidance that we're calling towards. And there is a general acceptance for us. And so the Sheikh says that this can also be seen in another example during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu the companion of the Prophet Sallallahu who was not aware that we're not supposed to talk during our prayer. And so when he started to talk, all the companions, the way they reacted was in a very negative manner. But the Prophet Sallallahu he didn't say anything until the prayer was complete. And then all he did was show him love and guided him in a very loving and caring manner, which resulted in this companion feeling loved by the Prophet Sallallahu And at the same time, he didn't like the way that the other companions had dealt with him. So he made a dua saying, Oh Allah, um, love me, uh, have mercy on me, and have mercy on the Prophet ﷺ, and don't have mercy on anyone else because of the way that they had dealt with the situation. And then the Prophet ﷺ, and that too is a lesson that he didn't, you know, yell at the companion for, you know, limiting the mercy of Allah. All he said was, you have limited something that is very vast, meaning the mercy of Allah, and you have made it very, very limited. <laughs> عملية الإرشاد يا أخوة هي أمور الإدراك مراحل أساسية المرحلة الأولى أننا نفهم المشكلة أو القضية فهم عام فهم عام المرحلة الثانية أننا نعرف العوامل التي تسببت في هذه القضية العامل الثالث أننا نخطط ونقرأ ونفكر ونطلع على تقديم الحل المناسب لابد من النظر العامة لهذا الموقف أو القضية ثم معرفة التفاصيل حول هذه القضية ثم التخطيط لتقديم العلاج المناسب لهذه القضية And so the Sheikh says, uh, the process of guidance involves three essential stages. The first stage involves understanding what the issue is. So getting a general understanding or picture of what the issue is. The second is trying to understand what caused that issue. And the third is exploring solutions and thinking about solutions for this issue that came up. بينما الجزء الكبير هو المختفي في الماء أو في الماء أو في البحر فإذا نظرنا بدون هذه المراحل فسيكون الحل جزئي والإرشاد يكون قاصر ولن نحقق العدد أما إذا نظرنا للمشكلة بدون هذه المراحل استكشاف ثم معرفة الجوانب الأخرى والعوامل المرتبطة بها and so the Sheikh says that the correct guidance involves these three things because it could be that the problem is like an iceberg where just the tip of the iceberg can be seen and the rest of it is underwater. So if we don't take our time in understanding what the issue is, we would only be trying to, we would only be working towards solving the apparent issue that's there. And this is going to result in a solution that is very partial and deficient. Whereas if we take our time in understanding what the whole issue is, we will understand it from all aspects and we will be able to come up with a solution that is holistic and deals with all the issues related to this problem. <laughs> 
المشكلات التحديات الانفجار المعرفي المعلوماتي كثيرة في واقع المعاصر فلا بد من علاج وإرشاد يكون إبداعي فلا بد من علاج وإرشاد يكون إبداعي And so the Sheikh says, in our times when, you know, there are so many different challenges and changes coming about and there is an information boom, even the solutions and the guidance that we come up with has to be, has to be very innovative to counter these new issues that are coming up. <laughs> And so we look towards the guidance of the Prophet ﷺ in his sunnah. We look at towards the Qur'an for guidance as well. We also look at, uh, you know, whatever latest information there is amongst the specialists in that field in our times. And so using all of this, we try to come up with a solution. <laughs> And so what we have to do when looking for solutions is mention a solution that is clear, that is innovative, that is complete, and that is comprehensive, that, in, you know, that encompasses all the different aspects of things that might be involved in this issue. And so just, you know, the traditional uh, guidance that we had or just the emotional forms of guidance that we had in the past, that will not be enough. Uh, excuse me, can I ask a question? Uh, can you just wait till, can you just write down your question, wait till the Sheikh's done and inshallah. After the example that the Sheikh mentions, he says. <laughs> And so the Sheikh is, the Sheikh is asking, uh, you know, basically this bottle that we have in front of us, what, how can we empty out the water from this bottle, from this container, in an innovative manner? And so, the, and so the Sheikh says the traditional method would have just been for us to unscrew the cap and then pour the water out. But the Sheikh says he wants an innovative method of taking out water from this water bottle. So the, and, and so the brother he mentioned using a straw. And the Sheikh says, yes, this is a new and innovative way that didn't exist in the past. What else? You can also let it evaporate in the hot sun. Uh, يعني نحطها في الخارج الشمس يعني. <laughs> نعم. Yes. Or, or by heating it, the Sheikh says, either the sun or by heating it to cause it to evaporate. Uh, the brother had mentioned uh, making a hole towards, uh, you know, at the bottom of the bottle. Oh, he, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he just said that, yeah, yeah. Can you use Sorry? Uh, he says using a syringe to take out the water from it. Oh, 
ما بعرفين يبقى ماش حتى يستوعب الماء. Or the sheikh says, and the brother said, you know, putting a cloth or a sponge in the bottle to let it soak in the water and then taking out the sponge and then squeezing out the water. Or the sheikh says, freezing the bottle until the water or the ice, you know, kind of uh, escapes the bottle. Rupture is the bottle. And so the chef says that, you know, just for taking out this water, the objective was to take the water out. We just mentioned so many different means of doing so. And the chef says, likewise, when we're giving guidance to someone, when we're calling someone to Islam, all these things, doing all these things, we also need to take into account different methods and means for doing so. And at the same time, uh, making sure that we are accounting for the person's psychological state, the, uh, the culture that the person comes from, and the different factors that might affect this individual. Uh, can I ask my question now? So, uh, huh? <laughs> yes, go ahead, because, sister. Uh, instead of, I um, uh, wanted to ask, like, for example, the, young, the youngsters using the gadgets, like, um, like what we did with the water bottles, could we like, bring some suggestions? How do we get the youngsters away from the electronic gadgets? Uh, so the sheikh says, inshallah, we'll just delay uh, answering that question till the end. It's an important question and how a counselor or parents can deal with this issue of uh, youngsters in our times uh, being so attached to, to these, uh, the, these devices. Inshallah, we'll mention that towards the end. And? يقول ما الفرق بين التربية والإرشاد؟ إحنا عندنا يا إخوة مصطلحات عندنا التربية وعندنا التعليم وعندنا التوجيه وعندنا التزكية وعندنا الإرشاد وعندنا التهديد وعندنا التنشية وعندنا التعليم وعندنا التعلم هاي يسمونها مترادفات مترادفات التربية وإرشاد الحقيقة هو من معاني التربية أو المترادفات التربية لكن إذا ذكر الإرشاد بمفرده فهو له معنى وإذا ذكر التربية بمفردها فلها معنى إذا ذكر الإرشاد بمفرده قد يجتمع على التربية ويجتمع على التعليم ويجتمع على التوجيه أما إذا ذكر التوجيه والتربية التربية والإرشاد التعليم والإرشاد التزكية والإرشاد التنشية والإرشاد يسمع لكل منهما معنى and so the Sheikh says, mentioning a whole bunch of different uh, synonyms for uh, tarbiyah. So he mentioned tarbiyah, ta'aleem, and tanshi'a, amongst others, and says all these are synonyms for the same thing. And if these are mentioned separately, then they can, uh, they can mean the same thing. But if they're you know, mentioned uh, together, then obviously each will have its specific meaning. But in the end, all these terminologies are used as a means 
to fulfilling the goals that one has, the higher objective, which is worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal. And so the Sheikh says that what we're going to talk about now are the different stages of uh, guidance. And the Sheikh says because in our times we find many people who are still uh, trying the old ways uh, and you know the generally accepted ways from the past without taking into account the person's uh, psychological state or the person's uh, or, or the time period that one is living in or the society that one comes from. <laughs> And so these forms of guidance or this, uh, the, the, the guidance for these individuals, the Sheikh says that these are fulfilled through taking into account these different aspects and not just basing it on, you know, the traditional method, methods that were there. Rather, we, it's, it's, you know, we can use innovation in this and also regarding for the time and the place and the society that one is in. And so the Sheikh is going to give us an example, a scenario where a woman, she visits her friend, and this friend, she, uh, you know, brings forth a meal, a cooked meal that has fish in it. And despite the fish being really small, the host had cut it up into smaller pieces. And so this guest, upon seeing this, she says, why is it that you didn't just leave the small fish as a whole instead of cutting it up into pieces? It would have been more presentable. It would have been, you know, it would have looked better if you had just kept it that way. <laughs> So this, the host, she responds and says, I don't know the reason for that, but my mother used to do this, and that's why I was just doing, or I'm just doing what my mother used to do, what I saw my mother doing. And so the grandmother or the mother, she is still alive. And so, you know, she responds and says that the reason that we used to cut it up before into smaller pieces is because the containers we used to have, the utensils that we used to have to cook the fish weren't big enough to uh, to cook the fish as a whole piece. And so we would have to cut it into smaller pieces to be able to cook it. But in, in, in our times, or for you, for example, you have a container that's large enough to cook the whole fish in, and therefore, that is what you should do. Instead of cutting it up into pieces, you should take the whole fish and cook it as one piece in whatever utensil you have. <laughs> And so the Sheikh says that, you know, it's very obvious, inshallah, 
or a parent what the purpose was behind the story, what are the lessons that we should be learning from this scenario that the Sheikh just mentioned? I think in thoughtless ways, we should drop all useless traditions. Uh, to blindly follow uh, without knowing the reason is sometimes the cause of uh, sometimes doing the wrong thing and we think we're doing the right thing. التقليد بدون معرفة السبب أحيانا جعلنا نفعل الخطأ من دون النشر. I think the mother, the, grand, uh, the mother or the lady, uh, tried to be very wise. She had to be wise to have answered them in such a way that none of the two ladies uh, would be bad. The one, her, her daughter, that tried to copy her, and the visitor that felt it had been done in a better way. If you look at the answer, she said, We used to do it that way. Because we had little smaller uh, uh, utensils, okay, which is very okay on, uh, when you look at the, the, the daughter's uh, position. She is she did just because the mom used to be that way. Now he gave the reason why it used to be that way. Now pleasing the other lady, the guest that came, says, in so far we have larger utensils now. It's having better prepared <coughs> food so that it will move better. It will have a, a better, uh, uh, to be, to be to more better presentable. To be seen. Mm -hmm. So I think she answered them in a very wise way that will make both of them happy and no one to feel uh, less uh, better than the other. When you call an aljada, Kamat be ijaba, be him raa, the benta, or Kazalik, the Sadiqata. All right, uh, so, sorry, the sister, she had something? Uh, yes, is this a, a similar um, to where the prophet, and, and I'm paraphrasing, so forgive me a lot, um, where he advised people not to follow the traditions of their forefathers? Uh, Instead, follow Islam, which may have new beginnings. Yes, yes, yes. He says it could be it could be applicable. The, the mic, sorry, the mic. Whoever has a mic. Uh, something can be appropriate in, a certain, in certain circumstances, but we shouldn't always uh, use it because the circumstances may have changed. So we need to be creative, like the speaker said, uh, to have appropriate solutions. Uh, that's why Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu said, Rabbu awladakum li zamanikum wa li zamanikum. But use different tools and different uh, ways of upbringing your children that are different from the ways that you were up to uh, yourselves. Thank you. Thank you.
and the day we move to another society, it has quite different values. So we should really understand what is the society value, and the day we can define our basic and our own part for it. كن لازم نقدر القيم في المجتمع وحسب المجتمع لو انتقلنا إلى مجتمع آخر لازم تدرس طيب هل يأتي إلى يحب هذا المثال هذا المثال أو التطبيق أو العمل التطبيق العملي اللي حدث بالفعل كان واقعيا هو يعني تبدل فيه كل ما ذكرت لكن الهدف منه أننا نحن في عملية الإرشاد ينبغي أن نمارس الإرشاد يعني الماء العملي القائم على المعرفة القائم على مجموعة من الأخلاقيات والمهارات حتى نحقق الهدف ونصل إلى المطلوب ولا نستخدم الأسلوب العفوي أو التقليدي الذي يستخدمه يعني عامة الناس مثلا خاصة في يعني مجتمعاتنا المعاصرة ربما الناس اليوم يتعاملون في بعض قضايا الإرشاد والتوجيه والتعليم والآداب بناء على ما لديهم من معلومات يعني قد لا تكون هي المعلومة الصحيحة أو قد لا تكون هي المعلومة المناسبة للواقع الذي نعيش فيه. إذا كان نحن نريد أن نقول أننا في عملية الإرشاد ينبغي أن نتعلم الأسلوب الأمثل المناسب للزمان والمكان وأن لا نقلد في مثل هذه الأساليب يعني بعض الممارسات أو الأساليب أو السلوكيات التي ربما كانت تستخدم تستخدم في الماضي وهي لا تتناسب مع and so the sheikh says that uh, that's why it is, is uh, all these examples that we gave, they all fall in line with what we're talking about and the importance of having the correct tone in guiding. Because it may be that the person is still using old knowledge that they had, which could be incorrect, or it could even be that now it's outdated. So it's not necessarily incorrect, but it's not applicable in our times anymore. So all these things need to be taken into account when we are counseling and when we're uh, giving guidance to others. <laughs> وبما يتناسب مع حال المدعوين أو المتربين أو المتعلمين في البيئة التي نعيش فيها في ضوء أيضا الضوابط الشرعية بمعنى لا نأتي بوسائل تكون فيها مخالفات شرعية لكن نحتاج إلى التجديد نحتاج إلى التجديد في وسائلنا نظرا لتوافر الإمكانات الموجودة والمتنوعة في مجتمعاتنا لاحظوا الآن يا إخوة الآن نحن نجلس هنا, هنا ومعنا الآن مجموعة من الإخوة ويشاركنا أيضا آخرون في مجتمعات أخرى بسبب ماذا؟ أننا جددنا في الأسلوب التربوي والتعليمي والدعوي واستخدمنا التقنية المناسبة لمجتمعاتنا ولواقعنا المعاصر. And so the Sheikh says that that is why uh, it is essential that we innovate in the tools that we have, whether it's for guiding others whether it's for giving da'wah, whether it's for, uh, you know, counseling and all these, as long as it is within the general Islamic guidelines, it shouldn't be going against the teachings of Islam. But, you know, we should be using all these um, innovations that we have. Just take an example or just look at what we're doing right now as an example. All of you are seated here. Uh, you know, listening to the talk, and then there are also people in other societies, for example, uh, listening through the internet, and they are able to also benefit from this because we are utilizing the technology that's available to us. And so we take all these different innovations that are out there, and we use these as tools, and also uh, the changes in society and all that, we also use those to undertake the process of calling others to Islam or to also uh, uh, counsel others. The 
لا يستطيع ان يمارس الا المتخصص الذي درس في كليه الطب تخصص الانسان النفسي لان فيه جزء منه سيقدم علاجا معرفيا وجزء اخر علاجا دوائيا هذا لا يستطيعه الا المتخصص فنحن الان امام ارشاد نفسي معرفي وارشاد كما يقال او علاج نفسي طبي نحن ما تدخلنا في النظريات ولا في الاليات ولا في الوسائل نحن تحدثنا عن الارشاد النفسي العام بمعنى ما ينبغي ان يراعى اثناء التعامل مع الاخرين من خلال مراعاه الجانب النفسي لديه And so the Sheikh says that what we're going to talk about next are the characteristics that should be present in this counselor. And he says that these, a lot of these are knowledge-based, so as long as you know, we uh, attain this knowledge, we can work towards it. And he says there's another aspect that is specific to the specialists. And you know, these are the doctors, the ones who deal with psychological issues, and they're the ones who treat the patient in both regards both the psychological as well as the medical. So they will know what medicines to also supplement along with whatever uh, forms of guidance they're giving. And so the Sheikh wants us to realize we're not talking about the different outlooks that a person may have with regards to guidance or counseling. Rather, we are talking about what needs to be taken into account and consideration when we are presenting these solutions to those seeking guidance. نأخذ الحقيقة أخوة أخواني الكرام بعض الأخلاقيات أو بعض الكفايات ونختم بها اللقاء ثم نجيب على السؤال الأخر أو إذا كان في أسئلة أيضا منكم هنا أو منهم هناك هناك أخلاقيات كثيرة بالنسبة للمرشد النفسي وهناك كفايات أنتم يعني ما طرحوا هنا مفاهيم عامة حول قضايا الإرشاد النفسي ما طرحوا هنا مفاهيم عامة حول قضايا الارشاد النفسي، بمعنى ان الذي يريد ان يقوم بالارشاد او الدعوه او التربيه او التعليم ينبغي ان يراعي الجانب النفسي عند الانسان، يراعي الجانب النفسي عند الانسان. So the Sheikh says that inshallah now we'll cover some essentials and some characteristics that this counselor needs to have. And you know th these are basic necessities that every Uh, counselor needs to have. And so what we've taken so far, what we've covered so far, are just general understandings of this guidance and what needs to be taken into account when we are giving this guidance. <laughs> And so the Sheikh says that an individual has psychological needs as well as needs related to the person's body and also needs that relate to the hereafter. And all these things need to be taken into account. <laughs> وأنت مدرس وفي في بعد عشر دقائق قال أحد الطلاب يا أستاذ أنا أريد الذهاب إلى دورة المياه فقلت أنت كمدرس المفروض أنك تقضي حاجتك قبل أن تدخل إلى الفصل وأنت الآن في الاختبار فإما أن تصبر وتنجز الاختبار وتخرج إلى دورة المياه وإما أن تسلم الورقة بما حصل من إجابة تذهب إلى دورة المياه لأنني أنا الوحيد الآن في الصف ولا يوجد أحد غيري وإذا خرجت أخشى هؤلاء يمارسون الغش أنت الآن معلم وتريد أن تقوم بعلاج هذه المشكلة فماذا تفعل؟ هل تسمح له بالذهاب إلى دورة المياه لقضاء الحاجة ثم العودة أن تمنعه أن يعني تأخذ منه الورقة ثم يذهب فهمت فهمت نعم فهمت نعم مهم أن نتصور. So the Sheikh says that 
uh, you know, and, and uh, something that relates to bodily needs is using the washroom. So now you, for example, if you were a teacher and you had given your students a test, and as they're rating a test 10 minutes into the test, one of the students uh, seeks permission to use a washroom, there are multiple ways that you can react to this. You could say, you know, uh, you could tell the student you need to wait. You knew that you had a test right now. You should have used uh, the washroom before you came into the class, before you started the test. And now you're in a test. You need to wait uh, until you're com uh, you've completed the test because I'm only one individual in this class. If I leave the class, the students, they might cheat and all this stuff. So either you hand in the test as you've written and then you may use a washroom and that's it. Whatever you answered is your test. Or you wait until you have completed your test and then you go use a washroom. What do you do as a teacher? Do you, do you give him permission to go use the washroom and come back and complete grading the test? Or do you tell him that, you know, you complete your test, hand that in, or you say, hand in the test, and then you may use a washroom. What would you do? And so, so the sheikh says, if a teacher were to come to you asking for your advice of what to do in this situation, how would you answer whether uh, from both the brothers and the sisters he would like a response? Uh, I would uh, speak to both first and then let him go to the bathroom by himself because uh, uh, it's like they're cheating the cheat phone out of them. Cheat sheets. He would say he would take his hand and he would allow him to be able to go from the car and he would allow him to go because he would allow him to go from the car. So ideally, the same thing, you would take the phone cord, but you would uh, try to find an escort to take them. Like, Another uh, student, you mean? Another student? Uh, you don't have anyone apart from the people in your class. He's by himself. Well, what I do is... Hey, you go ahead, sister. What I do is, first of all, I evaluate if the student is sleeping because she can't handle the pressure. She's using it as an excuse. And the urgency, if the need is actually urgent. If it's not urgent, I make her stay. If she's nervous, I just have a talk with her, and then she come, continues to test. All right, but if, if it's urgent, then what do you do? Then I would do what the brother did. I would take her phone and let her go. And let her come back and write the test? Yes. Uh, he a cool, uh, As a teacher, yeah. I would know what her grade level would be, takes the test. So if she cheated, you know that. He would say, as a teacher, he would know the level of this student. So he would know. هي تغش أم لا ولو رأت أن الحاجة ما يعني هي فعلا ما تستطيع تصبر تأخذ جوانها ويسمح أو تسمح لها. Sorry. It's urgent. She needs to use the washroom right now. She can't wait. You're giving advice to the teacher. Will you allow the student to go or no? You won't take the phone either? No, I will just let it go. Also, it depends on the student. She's known to be someone Please keep the mic close because 
When I was a student in the seven years uh, second preparation school, there were two classes, male and female, in the same room. And the male girl asked for story. But the teacher asked her to wait for five minutes. Do you know what happened? The female girl that was about 14 years at the time, she made urination for her sister in front of all the so this is shameful action, actually. She put it with the test. So the risk is to allow. First, if I have the exam, I ask a worker to be with the student. If there is a worker, so I ask the student, I take from the student his mobile, I take from anything he may use to complete the, the act of uh, taking from permission, and allow me to move peacefully. This is uh, my, my answer. Thank you. May I call Hassel Mavala Hulam Makan Yedros? أن القاعة كانت منقسمة بين الرجال والنساء فإحدى الطالبات استأذنت في الذهاب والمدرس لم يأذن لها فهي بانت في القاعة يقول هذه يعني فهو يقول سيسمح لها ويأخذ أي شيء يتعلق بالمادة أو أي شيء أو يعني أي شيء يستطيع الطالب أن يغش فيه But also the teacher prior to when it's having some agreements with the teacher or with the students that you need to go for the test, go to the back. Get out of the way, make sure students need to go at the moment. It depends on the student, of course. Okay, we got this. Up one way. Another way would be like uh, the chef said, the two options. Worst case scenario, then I'll say you have to touch your pockets. Then go. Yeah, just remember what we're, what we're covering, though. We had mentioned that we also analyze the state of the person. So if this person is dealing with this state, how, even if we're saying finish your test and then go, how will the test go? You know what I mean? Like, will he actually be able to pre perform to the best of his abilities? We tell him, just finish your test out and then go. He or she is not, you know, fully there, uh, into that. So I think that's what the sheikh is talking about more so. So in this case, do you let the person go? Or do you say, in whatever state you're in, you rate the test and then you may go? I think that's what it comes down to. All right, so inshallah, we're going to continue for about 10 15 minutes and then we're going to go pray. 20 minutes, about 20 minutes, inshallah. This is what we're going through. Uh, it depends on the students. We have this in my class. There are some students who are very against cheating. And I had a guy behind me who said, uh, tests are not a part of the deen, uh, so it's halal to uh, cheat. And I was very surprised, so. It is just depending on who the student is in the character. We say, the student is the student. For example, if the student suffers because they didn't use the restroom beforehand, it's a good lesson for the next time if the student is of a nature to do these kinds of things on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. So, they... هي تقول بأن هذا الطالب ممكن يتعلم من هذا من من ما وقع للمستقبل. The student needs to go to the restroom, the teacher should allow the student to go to the restroom. But the school now asks him, why did you do so? They say, this is your problem, you did not talk to another person with me. He says that the student is the student of the school, or the management of the school. Why did they not have a job? So he is the student to go to the school. ثم المدرسة لو أو الإدارة لو تقول شيء يقول هذه مشكلتكم أنتم لم 
يعني جميل ما تعرفون جميعا ونحن قلنا عندنا الإرشاد النفسي والذي يمارس الإرشاد النفسي لما كان يكون لديه معرفة بالحاجات الإنسانية بالحاجات باعتبار أن هذا مرتبط بالجانب النفسي هناك حاجات إنسانية في الإنسان عيب ما ذكرتموه جميلا لكن مقصودي منه أن هناك حاجات إنسانية المرشد ينبغي أن يكون ها عارفا بها بمعنى أن هناك احتياجات إنسانية ينبغي أن نعرفها ونتعامل مع مقتضيات الحياة أو التوجيه في ضوئها وقلنا نحن عندنا حاجات أساسية أو حاجات أولية وعندنا حاجات ثانوية وعندنا حاجات أخروية هذه ثلاث أنواع من الحاجات الإنسانية يحتاجها الإنسان والمرشد ينبغي أن يتعامل في ضوء هذه الحاجات And so the Sheikh says that we had mentioned that there are different types of necessities that, are, that need to be taken into account when we're giving this advice. So there are the primary necessities, and then there are the secondary necessities, and then there are the tertiary necessities. So all three need to be taken into account, but accordingly. <laughs> And so the advice that you give to this teacher who comes asking for your advice, you tell him or her, grant that, let that person, let that student use the washroom. Because if you don't allow for this person to go use the washroom, it's possible that you know he urinates or she urinates on him or herself in the classroom. And this is a big problem. And it, it did happen, as you know, we, we mentioned in these examples. And so the, the, the brother, he had mentioned the example that he himself witnessed where the student had uh, asked to use the washroom and the teacher didn't allow for that and she ended up urinating herself in the class. Why do we allow for them to use a washroom? And so this is a necessity that is linked to the body and it needs to be dealt with right away and it's not something that can be delayed. And so the Sheikh says that this relates to the primary necessity, and this includes other things as well, uh, being full, not starving, having slept enough, uh, the ability to, you know, breathe properly, it being a room where, you know, a person's able to breathe properly. And then there are also secondary necessities, such as a person needing uh, acts of gratitude or words of praise and uh, those things that cater to his psyche. But they're not like the primary necessities. They're not related to the body in the same way. I could praise you and I could not praise you. I could make dua for you, I could not. I could thank you or not do so. If I do so, then obviously it's better. You would love me and you would work with me better. But if I didn't do so, then it wouldn't be an issue. It's a secondary necessity. Obviously, the better thing to do is to go ahead with all these things. So that the person who has sought guidance does respond to what we're saying. 
ولدي اذا طلبت من ولدي ان يقدم لي شيئا مع الدعاء والثناء يفرح هو. So the Sheikh says that if he were to ask his son to do something and accompany that request with a dua for his son, that son would go ahead and do what he asked him to do. And if I and the Sheikh says that if he asks his son to do something without making dua for him or without praising him, it's not an issue. And then there are also tertiary necessities. And this is related to the hereafter and uh, linking the person to Allah Azza wa Jal and with the reward that that person seeks from Allah. And so one of the tools of, uh, of counseling is to bear in mind and to take into account the necessities that an individual has. هو أعتقد كمان يعني المثال السابق لما ذكرنا المدرس يسمح أو لا يسمح المدرس حتى لو طلب منه أن ينتهي من الاختبار الطالب هو أصلا يفكر في قضاء الحاجة ما يركز في الاختبار وما يجيب المسألة So basically in addition to you know the example that the Sheikh mentioned previously with regards to the student who had wanted to uh, use a washroom if the teacher asks the student to wait until he has or she has finished the test, what will be the mental state of this person who's trying to hold on, you know, he's, he's trying to hold back his uh, urine? That's what he or she is working towards. So their focus won't be on that test and they won't be able to perform to the best of their ability. So that also needs to be taken into account. And that would also be a reason for the teacher allowing the student to go use a washroom. ولذلك أيها الإخوة يعني كما لاحظتم الآن في الإرشاد راعينا هذا الجانب يعني راعينا مثل هذه الاحتياجات للإنسان أعطيكم أيضا مثال آخر الحقيقة في موضوع الإرشاد والحاجة إليه في مئاتنا أن هناك يعني عوامل أخرى مثلا على سبيل المثال العلم والخبرة مهمة في هذا الجانب. يعني من يريد أن يقوم بموضوع الإرشاد والتوجيه ويضبطه في المنهج النبوي أو الدعوي أو التربوي فلا بد أن تكون لديه الخبرة والمعرفة في هذا الجانب. And so, you know, all these are examples of uh, counseling and the Sheikh says that some of the other factors that are essential are that this person has the knowledge and the experience as well when he's counseling. Uh -huh. So the Sheikh says that we also, you know, look into the student. Why is it that he or she wanted to go to the washroom? It could be that the questions, they were uh, placed or they were uh, categorized in a way that didn't uh, go in line with his own, uh, what's it called, uh, his, his own understanding. and so the sheikh says uh, just clarifying what uh, he had said that it could be that the teacher put the hardest question the toughest question as the first question so when this person the student gets the test looks at the first question 
and obviously then the fear kicks in and now you know all the it, it doesn't go with the person's psychology of you know him easing or she easing into the test where the first questions are easier and then they build up to the harder questions <laughs> And so what the teacher needs to do is taken into uh, taken into account um, you know the the, psych the the psychological state of his students as well. So again, the sisters were just mentioning the male gender. It means both the male or the female. But to save time, I'm only going to mention one gender. I'll mention the female gender. So the teacher, she needs to take it into account. She she, uh, she needs to take into account the student's uh, mental state as well. So she keeps the easier questions in the beginning, and it gradually gets tougher and tougher and tougher until it gets to the most. Uh, or the hardest question in the end, the question that can differentiate or distinguish the the, the students uh, achieving the highest grades from those who do not, instead of uh, setting the first question as the toughest question, which may cause the person out of, you know, uh, not being comfortable anymore and out of, uh, what's it called, feeling uh, or, or, get, or getting scared of the test in general, even the basic information that they had memorized, they would forget that just because of the way that the questions were organized. So the teacher also needs to take that into account when she is making the test. <laughs> and so uh, this guidance, when it comes to psychological guidance, and you know, taking taking the psychology or the psychological state of a person into account, this is really important. Whether it relates to teaching, whether it relates to counseling, whether it relates to all these different things uh, uh, that we that we spoke about. <laughs> And so now the sheikh says we'll respond to the sister who had asked about uh, the youngsters in our times who are so attached to uh, these different gadgets that exist in our times. And so the sheikh says this answer actually requires a whole lecture on its own. And so the, the sheikh, he'll just mention it briefly in, in a few points now. And so the sheikh says the first thing is that within a household, there needs to be a system uh, of dealing with these devices. So there are rules set in place in the household. And so we limit the times that people in the household can use these gadgets. And the parents themselves also respect these guidelines that they set. And so we could even, for example, place a box in the house where everyone needs to keep their gadgets when they're not using them. And so before we go to bed, we put all the gadgets in this box, as an example. Or for example, uh, setting a rule that the person doesn't or their child doesn't start using these devices until they have finished all their schoolwork. And 
and also realizing, you know, whatever uh, negative impacts that this may have, these uh, gadgets have with regards to a person's health and also um, with regards to the way that the person uh, deals with the community. These are just some tools and some means of fulfilling, you know, or uh, understanding how to use these gadgets. And so the Sheikh says that even though we may not be fully uh, be able to uh, control the use of these gadgets by our children, by mentioning or by, you know, having general guidelines in the household with regards to the use of these gadgets, setting a time period for when these gadgets can be used and have uh, mentioning and clarifying or mentioning the, the ills or the negative, um, uh, basically uh, the, the, the adverse effects of using these gadgets, whether it's to the person's psychological state or whether it's with the way that, you know, a person is limiting himself with society, you know, we're just on these gadgets all t at all times. We don't know how to deal with the community anymore with other individuals. The Sheikh says, inshallah, these general guidelines will, inshallah, uh, make it better uh, and hopefully the kids will be, you know, they won't be fully under the control of these gadgets. <laughs> And so the Sheikh says the other important thing is that we also give them alternatives to these gadgets. Because if we don't give them alternatives, then they're going to, you know, come back to these gadgets. We can't control them at all times when they're outside the house and all that. So we give them alternatives. And as long as those alternatives are there, then inshallah, we have covered that. But if those alternatives aren't there, then they're going to go back uh, to these gadgets. And we also warn our children against sites that deal with misguidance or misconceptions or that may instill doubt, doubts in a person with regards to one's faith and also sites that may have, uh, you know, uh, things that are inappropriate images and all that sort. We need to warn them of all these things. And there, we need to continually remind them of these guidelines. Especially those related to a person's character and the person's religion and the person's health. So that, inshallah, the use of these gadgets is only in things that are beneficial and not things that are contrary to that. I have a question. Yes, go ahead, sister. There's a growing problem in the West. I consider it a problem, and I was wondering the Sheikh's opinion on it. It seems that more of the young women are coming to Salah and the Masjid wearing hijab and pants. Um, and I'm not sure how to approach these girls because you want them to come to the Masjid and you'd rather them pray in pants and not pray at all. On the other hand, um, it influences other girls that they can also pray in pants. So I'm not sure how to deal with that. <laughs>
التعامل الحقيقي مع البنات او الفتيات في هذه المرحله يحتاج الحقيقه الى ادوات او الى وسائل ومراحل. المرحله الاولى ينبغي ان تفهم ان هذا عباده لله تبارك وتعالى. ان موضوع الحجاب هو عباده واستجابه لله تبارك وتعالى ولرسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم مبارك عليه. So so the Sheikh says that when we're dealing with issues, uh, with these kind of issues, uh, for example, this issue of women not wearing the hijab properly, the first stage is to make them realize that this hijab is an act of worship, which we are doing uh, which, uh, uh, as a fulfillment of the commandment of Allah Azza wa Jal, as a commandment that even the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi told us. Uh, so this is something that is an act of worship. And the other thing that needs to be taught to them is that when they are wearing this hijab properly, they are actually following the guidance of the mothers of the believers, meaning the wives of the Prophet and also the, you know, the various believing women that came throughout history. And so the third thing that we need to tell her is that this is something, this hijab is something that distinguishes her from others. And so when she's wearing this hijab properly, then obviously she is distinguished and it is apparent that, you know, she is, a, inshallah, a believer in all that. And then if she is wearing, uh, practicing the hijab properly, then she is actually fulfilling uh, the rules related to modesty and she is not just not only is she modest but she is also loved for that and due to this hijab that she wears or practices properly Allah may make it a means for her to get married to a righteous man uh, who is looking for these characteristics and the sheikh says that another thing to realize is that this lady who is dressed modestly she will be respected and regarded in a better manner than someone who doesn't because she is trying to be modest and you know fulfill the commandments of Allah and so, you know, this lady, she realizes that if she does do the hijab properly, then she is someone who is fulfilling this in a very tough situation, like in a society where that doesn't really happen. And all this shows that this lady is someone with a strong personality and someone who is, you know, able to realize the importance of these matters. And the Sheikh says that it also grants her self-worth and also, uh, you know, confidence in herself. And obviously, as we're discussing this with these women that may be coming in wearing, you know, pants and stuff to the masjid, we do so in a, a very polite and calm manner where we're discussing the issues 
and, and you know, and, and similar to the examples that we took from the life of the Prophet And then the teachers and the mothers and all of these other women that these girls look up to, if they're dressed modestly and appropriately, then they can be an example for these young sisters as well. Thank you. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> هل هو يعني واقع في في الشخصية في شخصية الإنسان أو هو يعني إيجابي ولا قد ولد الشخص لا لا هو يعني الإنسان حقيقة يولد على الفطرة ما في مولود إلا ويولد على الفطرة والفطرة الإنسان يولد سوي حتى بعض الدراسات لو كان هناك خصائص وراثية التربية والتعليم والتوجيه تضعف ذلك الأمر ويعالج جزء من الإشكالية تأتي من خلال المعايشة والممارسة في أثناء مراحل مبكرة من عمري نتيجة إهمال التربية ونتيجة إهمال الوالدين ونتيجة الحياة في بيئة مارس فيها مثل هذه القضايا ونتيجة المشاهدات ونتيجة أيضا بعض الشخصية أو الاعتداء على الموضوع نعم نعم هو حتى في الغرب الآن علماء النفس يقولون حتى هم يقولون أنه ما نستطيع أن نقول لأنه الغرب كثير من الناس يريدون يقولون أن الشخص ولد هكذا ولكن العلماء في هذا الجانب يعني علماء قصدي ليس علماء الإسلام علماء الغرب يقولون أنه فعلا المجتمع له أثر كبير في هذا ف... يعني شو شو يا أخي؟ يعني في عندنا كقواعد القضية الأولى الأصل الإنسان حقيقة السلامة من هذه الملوثات بالفطرة الأصل فيها السلامة فالإنسان يولد بالفطرة أو يولد سوية من هذه الإشكالات كيف تنتقل هذه؟ تنتقل إليه نتيجة ضعف التربية في الأسرة أو معايشة ناس يفعلون ذلك أو نتيجة مشكلات واضطهاد أسري أو تربوي أو مدرسي أو مجتمعي فيلح فيلجا يبحث عن ها يبحث عن من يشفع له هذا أو يكون نتيجة معايشة مع أناس مجرمين يمارسون هذه القضايا فمارسوها معه حتى أصبحت جزء من شخصيته وسلوكه أو يكون هو ضعيف شخصية لا يستطيع أن يدافع عن نفسه ولا يستطيع أحد أن يحميه أو تكون الحاجة يكون حاجة لا يوجد من يقدر له طعام ولا شراب ولا المال ولا شيء من ذلك وربما يقع في مثل هذه القضايا إذن هي سلوك مكتسب سلوك مكتسب من البيئة التي يعيش فيها الإنسان وليس سلوكا يعني فطريا ولد الإنسان به So the brother had asked with regards to people who engage and acts with the same gender, is it nature or is it nurture? And so the Shaykh says, with regards to nature, then the Prophet ﷺ, he had mentioned that there is uh, no child is born except in the state of fitra. And then all these uh, things that a person may uh, be affected by are usually at the young age if their upbringing isn't uh, done properly or if the, if the parents didn't, um, you, you, they weren't there fully uh, for, the, for their children's upbringing, so the society around them, when they see all these things happening, they can also take in these different things, and so a lot of it is nurture. And I just uh, added to the Sheikh a point that even uh, specialists in the West, non-Muslims, they also acknowledge, they'll acknowledge that, you know, you have some people who are activists, they'll say it's 100% nature, a person was born like this. But people who are actually specialists in this field they will acknowledge that at least a certain percentage is nurture. And so, with regards to nature, then we have the narration of the Prophet ﷺ where he mentioned that every child 
is born upon the fitrah. <laughs> and the Prophet ﷺ, uh, Allah Azza wa Jal, He said that we created the human being in the best of forms. <laughs> And the punishment that, uh, you know, these people received, it was from one of the most severe of punishments in, in, in history, like mentioned in the Quran. And it is something that is uh, prohibited in, across all religions. Yes. So the, the brother was mentioning that, uh, you know, if it was nature, then we would have seen this from the earliest of history. Rather, what we see Lut I'm saying to the people of Sodom is that this is an act that no one before you had proceeded to. And so this is something that they had initiated in his time. And we also see, like, around us, there are a lot more cases now than there were before. Some might say, well, that's because there's more freedom to express themselves now. But even then, like, what we're seeing is, you know, it's, it's, it's becoming, like, it's, it's spreading so fast because of the accept, it's being accepted all across the board. And at times, as the Sheikh mentioned, it could be because this person had a weakness in his personality or her personality. So if they were not treated properly as a child, or they, or, or for example, if, if, if it was a boy and the other boys used to bully him and he went, you know, more towards the girls, then he has that affinity with the girls to the extent that he also starts to take in that personality of the people that he is spending time with. And so, uh, again, I'm not a specialist in this. I don't claim to be. But these are all factors that we need to take into account, uh, take into account, especially because we do have specialists in the West who acknowledge that it is not 100% nature. So if they're acknowledging that it's not 100% nature, they're saying that there's a part of it that's nurture. We say, well, we believe as Muslims that Allah Azza wa Jal created us in the perfect form and according to the fitrah. So nature-wise, we negate that. Yeah, that's what I said. No one says that. Go ahead. And so the brother, he was saying that another way to, you know, address this issue is other ills that exist in society. We don't say that the person was born with these ills or these characteristics or the desires to do these certain acts, right? Or we haven't said it yet. Who knows in the future the way things are going, they might accept that as well. يقول الأخ إنه توجد هناك أشياء أخرى أخلاقية وهي ما نقول هي يعني يعني الشخص قد ولد يعني مثلا الذي يحب أن يسبق أو الذي يحب أن يفعل الفواحش يعني بغير الإنسان ومثل هذه. ف 
يعني لماذا نقول ان هذه الاشياء مكتسبه وهذا قد ولد بها؟ فيقول لا يقول يعني هذا نستطيع ان نرد على من يقول اي نعم No, but uh, identical twins doesn't necessarily mean they're going to have the same personalities because they can have different personalities. Uh, per identical twins just talks about uh, phys physically they're similar because even. Uh huh. Uh huh. يكون توأم فلو يكون هذا شيء يعني قد ولد به المفترض يكون يعني توأمان بنفس الصفة بل نجد من مثلا التوأم هو يعني ما هو لا يعني هو هذه المسألة الأصل فيها السلامة من هذه القضايا الإنسان حقيقة يوجد بدون يعني جينات خاصة بمثل هذه القضايا ولو وجدت يعني في جوانب أخرى أو وجدت أخرى في جوانب أخرى مثل كما ذكر أخونا الضغط الإيماني، السرقة، مثلا بعض الجوانب، فالبيئة والإيمان والتقوى والتربية والتعليم تعالج كل هذه القضايا. التربية، التعليم، التأديب، الإيمان، التقوى تعالج كل هذه القضايا بإذن الله تبارك وتعالى. والإنسان إذا دخل في الإسلام وآمن بالله تبارك وتعالى وبرسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وطبق تعاليم الإسلام وقام بشعائر الإسلام يحفظه الله عز وجل من مثل هذه الملوثات ومن مثل هذه القضايا. وجزء من هذا يكون مكتسب، جزء منها يكون مكتسب من خلال البيئة التي يعيش فيها الإنسان. And so the Sheikh says that, you know, some of the things that we had mentioned, such as, for example, a person having a desire to steal and all that, as long as he or she is able to address these issues and the community is able to address these issues and he or she is taught uh, from the guidance of the Prophet ﷺ and is taught that all these things, for example, such as stealing, it's haram, it's not allowed, it's prohibited, then the person's iman, as it grows stronger, then all these desires that that person may have he will try to control these desires. Likewise, it's possible that there are also other desires that one needs to ward off, and as long as the society is working towards that and the person seeks counseling, then inshallah, all these things are things that one can deal with. And the Shaykh says, if one's iman is strong, then inshallah, Allah will protect this person from such things. And at the same time, a person who does have these desires needs to understand that they need to basically ward off these desires and not act upon them. أو بسبب عدم وجود قوانين معظمة رادعة أو أو بسبب ضعف الإيمان هذه جزء منها تنتقل من هذه الأسباب وإلا الأصل الإنسان الحقيقة السلامة والخير والبر والتقوى والطاعة والعبادة هذا الأصل في الإنسان. And so the sheikh says that the default position is that the person is righteous and the person is free from all these things and a lot of it can be attributed to deficiency in the person's upbringing, so the parents were not really fulfilling that uh, right of their children, of raising them properly, or it could be that the society as a whole was not doing so, whether it's the teachers, whether it's the school, and so it's important for us to, inshallah, address these. <laughs> والأم راعية في بيت زوجها ومسؤولة عن رعيتها أعتقد أن القيام بهذه المسؤولية يحمي الآخرين من مثل هذه السلوكيات المنحرفة. And so the Sheikh says that he will end off this with the statement of the Prophet ﷺ where he said that all of us are shepherds and all of us are, are responsible for our flock. And so it's also the mother with regards to the household 
And so if all these things are undertaken properly, then inshallah these things will be addressed as well. And the Shaykh says that that's why the punishments that were mentioned were mentioned so that it would be a means of uh, stopping a person from just blindly following their desires. That's it. That's it. All right, so inshallah, with that we conclude. And if there were any shortcomings from my end, I ask you to forgive me. Uh, and if there were